remember learning how to swim. The first memory I have is actually being on a backpack. My mom was a swim coach, and so I've been around swimming my whole life. And I do vaguely remember my first competition. And all I remember is taking a few strokes and then frantically grabbing the lane line. Quickly after that, my, I joined a summer league team. I played basketball. I did soccer. I did track. I was even a gymnast until I realized I was going to be 6'1". <laughs> Very quickly, swimming became my life, my love, and my passion. We, through the summer league team, I, I swam in the summers from when I was 5 to age 11. And at 11, we quickly had to find more competitive waters for me. My family decided that we would make the 50-minute trek to and from a year-round team so that I could start to compete at a higher level. In a few short months, when I was 12, I qualified for the most elite meet in the country, the U.S. Olympic Trials. I remember being 12. I remember watching women's dreams come true, and that's where my dreams were born. And I... I remember I was such a competitive little thing. And even at 12, I was so mad that I came in 49th out of 101 women. <laughs> My dad had to keep reminding me of all the grown women that I had sent home packing that day. At 13, I qualified for the Goodwill Games in Brisbane, Australia, and that's where I brought home my first gold medal. At 14, I qualified for the Pan American Games in Santo Domingo, set numerous meet records, and also brought home multiple medals. I had become an elite child athlete. I was as healthy as I could be, didn't have a care in the world. And then at 14, I was diagnosed with an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat. Cardiologists informed me that I had an extra electrical pathway in my heart. My dad described it to me as an extra spark plug in an engine that just randomly decides to rev. Luckily, I was told a simple procedure would cure what I had. They would go in through my femoral artery and they would carterize that extra electrical pathway. I found hope in knowing that there were multiple other swimmers just in the Dallas area who had the same procedure and were already back into the pool. This is nothing, I thought. I'm strong, I can still be invincible. And that's when the hammer dropped. During testing, the cardiologist informed me that they had seen patterns of long QT syndrome. That's the resting period between your heartbeats. It, it takes too long. OK, so I'm just in really good shape, right? My heart can afford that. They informed me that long QT, you can develop uncontrollable and dangerous rhythms because of a surge of adrenaline. I could die doing athletic activity. I, we were informed that a, a friend coming up and scaring me or having a nightmare could send my heart into these fatal rhythms. In short, my swim meet after swim meet world had come to a screeching halt. Some doctors would say that I could never do athletics again, ever. Some doctors would say that I could continue to work out but definitely not the 11 practices a week, five hours a day for the past three years. As many of you know, all I needed was a glimmer of hope, just the possibility that my life as I knew it wasn't over. And that's when I got my silver lining. The cardiologist couldn't pinpoint that the, the rhythms that he saw happened when I was working out. A 24-hour monitor showed that he saw one of the rhythms when I was watching TV, when I was eating dinner, but never when I was doing, when I was actually working out. As a 14-year-old, I was like, okay, so no more TV and no more eating, and then I can swim. <laughs> but my family sat down and we discussed my life as, as a swimmer and as a human being. Do I, do I give up on my Olympic dream altogether? Do I do I live in that sense of fear for, for the rest of my life? And as a family, we, we really decided to look down every possible avenue so that I could continue doing what I loved. I could continue to race and be in the pool. We were told that every time that I worked out, I would have to have a defibrillator unit by my side just in case my heart stopped. 
so for me, in that moment, all the fear and all the anxiety that I had transferred to my mom. <laughs> she had to carry around the defibrillator at every practice that I went to. <laughs> Looking back, I'm, I'm so grateful for the strength that my mom had to be able to get up and come to every weight session, every pool workout, every cardio workout that I had, and to sit there holding a unit just in case your daughter's heart stops. I know now that the strength that I had as a 14-year-old came from my mom allowing me to just know that everything was going to be fine and just to push forward and continue to chase that Olympic dream. And it definitely paid off. When I was 16, in 2004, I qualified for the US Olympic team. I had won the 200 freestyle, and we were headed to Athens, Greece, where the Olympic tradition began. There, my dream set fire. We, we raced our hearts out, and we, in world record time, won a gold medal in the two, uh, four by 200 freestyle relay. I was on the highest podium looking out at that pool. And when you're standing up there, all the sacrifices are worth it. The er, going to bed early, the not eating the junk food that my friends were eating, not going to movies late at night, and just the hours that my family had put in, everything was worth it when you're standing up there hearing the national anthem. But ultimately, my family was winning over all the challenges that we had faced. And when I stand here and I close my eyes, I, I can still see the arena. And it was a, I could just see the glistening pool headed out and, and the stands. And straight across the pool, they had the three flagpoles and the US flag being raised and hearing the national anthem. And through all of it, I can still see exactly where my parents were sitting. And I can see their faces and just the sheer joy and pride that they had in, the, in that moment. Winning a gold medal opens incredible doors for you. I could basically go to any college in the country that I wanted to. I left my small town of Granbury, Texas, and headed off to the University of Florida. Sorry, Gators, that only lasted a year. <laughs> it was not the right fit for me. And when I left, I had a herniated disc in my low back, and I had severe shoulder tendonitis that was preventing me from doing a lot of the training. I decided to transfer to the University of California, Berkeley. <laughs> the program is known for empowering young women. It's known for re rehabilitating athletes, and they just really take a look at how the human body is supposed to function and be healthy. So arriving there, I was able to turn my focus to 2008. In 2004, I was the underdog. Nobody expected me to win. Nobody really expected me to make the Olympic team. I did. But it was a very different story in 2008. I started obsessing about how many events people expected me to make, what other people expected me to do when I was at the trials, what would happen if I failed them, if I let them down, if I didn't win. And walking out for those races, I was just petrified. And I may have overcome heart disease in 2004, but in 2008, I found myself just crumbling under the pressure. A lot of people don't know how the trials work for making an Olympic team in swimming. It doesn't matter how you do the four years before. I could have been the world record holder, but on that day, on that one night, I have to get first or second or I don't go to the Olympics. In 2008, I missed making the Olympic team in all three of my events. One as close as three hundredths of a second. My obsession with other people's expectations and just the paralyzing fear that I had of failing them had made me completely lose the love and the passion that had driven me all the years before. So I took a good long look at my career and my, my life as a swimmer and I did question if I was going to keep going. How could I keep going with, with the injuries and the, the amount of pressure that I had been putting on myself? And I just I decided that I wanted to keep going, but I needed to assess what was crippling my love for the sport. 
basically I came up with three different things. My, I needed to get healthy. I was still suffering from the back injury that I had gotten my freshman year. I was still struggling. I was, I was just exhausted all the time. And I had horrible stomach aches that I had assumed were from stress and practices. And I had never wanted to tell anybody. I didn't want to say like, oh, coach, I have a tummy ache. I, I felt like I was supposed to handle that one. And so I started chipping away at, at what was keeping me from loving the sport. I, I like setting series of small goals. Sometimes making a huge goal of, okay, now I want to go to the 2012 Olympics can seem kind of daunting. So I have to take it day by day and set smaller goals. So my three major goals, get healthy, cure stomach aches, and make a training program that's the best for me, physically and mentally, not just based on what everyone else was doing. Working with my coach, we developed a plan to really get my body healthy. We filled my free time with Pilates, with ballet, with um, ballroom dancing, and a lot of stability training. And by 2009, I was injury free. I, the, Ca the Cal Bears had just won their first NC2A national title. I broke two American records, one in the 200 free at, at the national championships, and then in the long course 100 butterfly, got my first American record. By 2011, I was stomach pain free. We d I discovered that I had food allergies. I needed to take gluten and eggs out of my diet. And through changing my diet extensively, that led me to win my first world championship gold medal in the 100 butterfly and break my own, my own American record. My coach and I put in the hours after that to reach my new goal, breaking the world record in the 100 meter butterfly. So in June, we headed off to the Olympic trials again in Omaha, Nebraska, and Memories of my failure in 2008 just came flooding back. Walking into that arena was like hitting a brick wall. The arena looked identical. And I just kept having to remind myself, I'm, in a, I'm a different person. I, I've done different training. So I just, my coach and I decided that we would unintensify the pool. So we walked around the arena like we had never seen it before, just ooing and aahing at all the technology and the big screen TVs and all this stuff that was all around the pool. And when I got in, I just played around. Um, I used to play mermaid all the time when I was little. And so I was like swimming under the water and jumping. And it just made me realize that this was, this was just a pool. I, I could still do this. I told myself that all I could control was being the best Dana that I could be. I couldn't control what the other athletes did. I just had to focus on what I had trained to do. I changed my interpretation of nerves. Instead of thinking, oh no, I'm nervous and getting stressed, I told myself, oh good, I'm nervous. That means that my body is ready to go out there and do something that I never thought that it could. I walked out on that pool deck a newer, stronger Dana. And on the second day of Olympic trials, I made the 2012 Olympic team and again broke my own American record. This Olympic team went on to win multiple more world records, multiple gold medals, and all three medals in general. And I walked away from London with an absolutely unforgettable experience. And more than remembering my time or actually racing, I'll remember the girls and the team and the experience that we had there. I know now that I wouldn't be the person that I am right now without each and every one of the challenges that I've faced in my career. Each one changed the path that I thought I was supposed to be on, but I kept pushing after my goal and it, it made the end experience something that I never even had dreamed of. And it was so much better than I could have ever thought. I've become an advocate for heart health and research and I've have a better sense of who I am and what I want in life, and all of that was discovered through the challenges that I faced throughout my career. In 2004, I had to overcome a heart injury. In 2008, 
I had to deal with the mental side of the sport and, and I crumbled. And then in 2012, they all came together. The heart and the mind were there and ready to push me forward. As I turn my sights now to 2016 in Rio, I know that I'm going to have an interesting set of challenges. I've had it each four years. There's been something new. And now I feel like I have the, goal, the, the tools to get through any of those challenges. I'll continue to set series of small goals. And I know that by 2016, I'll reach a place that I haven't even dreamed of yet.